Evelyn, thank you all for, uh, for attending our uh, typical Thursday fuel meeting today. I uh, would like to, and our speaker, we got, all got the email about the speaker. Uh, this gentleman has been a pastor at Central Baptist Church for about seven years. The main thing, before I invite Leroy to come up, is we all need to pray for Leroy's wife, who is... Uh, he can tell you more, probably nine and a half months pregnant. So, uh, Hello. in and out of the hospital. But uh, Leroy is a friend. He's a great preacher at Central Baptist. If you guys are looking for a ministry or something to go to on Tuesday, every Tuesday at noon, Central Baptist has a men's lunch. Uh, Central Baptist is, you know where it is on the country club, uh, a block and a half south of 192. One block west of Babcock. Anyway, Leroy is the pastor there because he's been there for seven years, so since we come a little bit of time away from him, fix the camera while Bill is eating here. No. Anyway, let me introduce you to our speaker, Pastor Leroy Williams. Yeah, not quite nine and a half months. We're just at 38 weeks right now, so within the next week or two, uh, we hope to be bringing home a little boy or girl. It's going to be one or the other. <laughs> you know, if you don't know what it is yet, I, I advise that, man. We found out with the first four, and uh, that was great. We were able to do the rooms and all that, but with the last two, we said, we're not. We're just going to see what God gives us, and what an amazing thing it was. And when I come to a group like this, I have to assume a couple of things. I have to assume that you're human just like I am. I have to assume that you walk through... Uh, victories and successes, but you also walk through difficulties and problems just like I do. Is there anybody in the room who has no problems? Let me just ask that. <laughs> nobody. Everybody has some sort of problems, and everybody's dealt with difficulties along the way. And I think that's why a story like Peter walking on water stands out so much to so many people. You see, the story was preached back in the 80s. A book was written on it called Get Out of the Boat. And many people have preached that message of Peter walking on the water. And what they do is they bring you to an understanding that in the midst of life's storms, the safest place to be is in the presence of Jesus. And so when Peter was told to get out of the boat and walk on the water, he was walking to the presence of Jesus. What we need to understand through that is in the midst of life's storms, that we know that God's presence is there, and we know that God's provisions will always be there. So that, that story, that sermon, that book, resonated with so many people. But I want you to pay attention, if you remember that story, most everybody does, I want you to pay attention that when Jesus told Peter to get out of the boat, He only spoke to Peter. And what I want you to understand by that is faith only begins where God has spoken. And so whenever Jesus spoke to Peter and He says to Peter, Peter, you get out of the boat and come to Me, then God has spoken, and since God has spoken, now Peter has the opportunity to act on faith based on what God has said. And so Peter steps out of the boat and starts walking over to Jesus. And of course, you know, he took his eyes off of Jesus, started looking at the wind and the waves, and he sank. Now, many people, many speakers, even I, back a few years ago when I preached that message, said, you know what? When we look at Peter, we downcast him for taking his eyes off of Jesus and sinking, but yet you don't, you don't think about the rail huggers that were back in the boat. You see, they didn't get out of the boat. Well, they couldn't get out of the boat on faith because Jesus didn't tell them to. But Jesus did tell Peter to, and so it was Peter that took his eyes off of Jesus. So the point is, we, we can only place faith in what God has spoken. And I believe that when we see what God has spoken and we start following Him, then that is something that we are walking in through faith. There's another storm story I want to point that out with in Acts chapter 27. So if you have your Bibles and you want to open up to Acts chapter 27, uh, please feel free to do so. Because in Acts chapter 27, this is a storm story where God speaks much as well. He speaks much to Paul. And Paul is on his way to Rome. He has been arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel. He's gone into the temple. He was actually trying to make good with the people in the temple uh, by going through the Nazarite vow back in Jerusalem. But they saw him. They arrested him. And they were about to bring everything they could upon him. And Paul said, wait a minute, I'm a Roman. 
And he appeals to Caesar. And as he appeals to Caesar, they have to recognize that and transport him so that he might have a place in front of Caesar, which was God's plan all along, and Paul knew that. He understood that he was supposed to have a place in front of Caesar, and he was looking forward to that. So he understood this transport that he was about to be on was part of God's plan. But yet, in the midst of following God's plan, storms still come. Did God tell the disciples to get in the boat and go across the other side of the lake? Did Jesus tell the disciples to get in the boat and go across the other side of the lake? Yeah, it was Jesus' plan for them to do that. And the storm still came where we get the story of Peter. Here in Acts chapter 27, God's plan was for Paul to go to Rome and be in front of Caesar. But a storm still comes. Look at this storm in, in chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of the Adramidium, Adramid, let me say that right, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus of Macedonia and Thessalonica was with us. So you catch that in verse 2. We, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. They had a plan. They had their ship log. They had their desires in place. And they knew where they wanted to sail. Did storms figure into their plan as they started to set sail? Probably not. Probably as they started to set sail. They looked around. Skies look good. Seasons are well. Hurricane season hasn't started yet. We're okay. Let's set sail. So they did not figure into the plan. And my friends, that's the thing about our lives. Storms don't usually figure into our plans either. We don't usually think about what it means down the road when we'll get fired. We don't ponder a divorce that might come in our life. The diagnosis that one day a doctor might deliver doesn't ever register when health is a part of the equation. We don't even think about death, although we know that 100% of all people who are ever born die. We don't think about those things. But yet difficulty is going to be a part of the day. When you get to verse 3, it says, In the next day, we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go with his friends and receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus. Uh-oh, you start to get a hint here. You start to see the problems that are arising because the winds were contrary. Anybody ever had a contrary wife? <laughs> Testify, right? Because the winds were contrary. It's not good. That means it's not good. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off the Lycia, Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. Then the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and we put on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off of Nidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Haven. What a contradictory term that is. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Haven. It's near the city. Uh, let's say, did you catch all the terminology in there? It was sailing slowly. The winds were contrary, sailing with difficulty. We came to this place called Fair Havens, and, and so they did not see the storm coming. They did not know how long it would last, and they did not know how God would use it. But nonetheless, when they set sail, the storms came. Here's the point that we're going to see throughout the whole Acts chapter 27 passage. God redeems everything. God redeems everything. The storms that come in your life, the storms that come in my life, God will redeem them for His glory. If you're a believer, God not only redeems those storms for His glory, but He redeems those storms for your good as well. What are we told in Romans chapter 8, verse 28? For God works all things together to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. You see, the fact of the matter is, God knows those storms are going to come. And Jesus told the disciples to go. He knew there was going to be a storm. He was going to walk down into the water and He was going to show His glory. Whenever God sent Paul to Rome, He knew there was going to be storms on this sea. And He knew that He was going to redeem them for His glory. 
God redeems everything for His glory. Let me show you, continuing on in Acts chapter 27. What God did in this storm was He enabled Paul, and He enabled all the rest that were on this ship to see what was truly important. If you continue on in verse 9, we read this. Now when much time had been spent, and selling was now dangerous, that's kind of an understatement from what we just read, because the fast was already over, that means that during the season when the fast took place, it's kind of like here in Florida, whenever we enter into, what is it, June, you start saying, hmm, we better start getting ready for hurricane season. It was that time of the year, the fast was over, it marked the beginning of the dangerous time uh, of the season. Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. You see, storms enable us to see what's truly important. Paul's looking out, and I believe Paul had a word for God. Now, he did not say, God has told me there will be storms along the way on this voyage. He did not say that. But why would he venture to give information to a captain and to the seagoing sailors that were on this ship unless maybe God had spoken a word of danger, a word of caution to him. There would be no other reason for him to say anything. So apparently he heard something from God and he gave that point of information uh, to the sailors. Now if there's storms on the horizon, his worries are this, guys. There's going to be loss of cargo. There's going to be loss of ship. And I perceive there'll be loss of lives. You see, when troubles come into our lives, it lets us see clearly the things that are important. And that's what was going on here with Paul. When you get to verses 11 through 16, he sees the understanding of shelter and safety over desire. They had a desire to set sail. They had a desire to get where they were going. But all of a sudden, shelter and safety becomes the preeminent thought on all of their minds. Look at verse 11 and through 16. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail. By, by the way, here, here's a good rule for all of us to understand. The majority is not always right. Okay? I'm a Baptist, and I have to say the majority is not always right. And we vote on everything. <laughs> I'm just, I just got to say that. And because the harbor was not suitable to bear, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete open toward the southwest and northwest in winter there. When the south wind blew softly, oh, life's good. Supposing they had obtained their, see that word, desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurycliden. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've heard our names for different storm systems, haven't you? We name storm systems. We say, this is an El Nino. This is a La Nina. We have different names to, to specify these different kind of things that come up. Then we start naming hurricanes, and we attribute those qualities to them. Well, they had something called the Eurycliden, which they understood to be a very terrible wind that would arise. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her die. And running under the shelter of an island, now catch this, here's where safety and shelter is taken for evidence, their desire. Let's get there, let's go. Soft wind, nice sailing, let's get out of Dodge. All of a sudden, your cloud comes, desires go by the wayside. And all of a sudden, safe shelter and safety becomes what they're interested in. Verse 16, running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. You know what a skiff is, right? It's that escape boat that's on the side of a big boat. It's the little boat you get in when the big boat's going down so that you might be tossed and turned in the waves, but you'll survive. And they said, we need this. If this ship goes down, we've got to make sure this skiff's not broken apart by banging against the big boat. So they secured it. And they were looking out for their safety, diving under the island of Claude. Verse 17. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. They tied that ship tight 
Making sure those boards don't work apart from each other. Making sure that ship stays above water. They're all worried about shelter and safety over their desires. My friends, when the storms of your life comes in, you start thinking about what's really important. You start thinking about life and how life can be preserved. That's exactly what's going on here. Look, continuing in verse 17. When they had taken the ski of foam board, they undergirded it. And verse 18, And because they were exceedingly tempest-tossed the next day, they lightened the ship. They've taken every measure they can to stay afloat. Taking all the ballast weight off of the ship, throwing it overboard, and making sure that all those unnecessary weights that were weighing that ship down in the water, which had a purpose at one time, now were being left in the ocean because they no longer have a purpose. Those are meaningless rocks and boulders and things like that. But when life starts getting difficult, the meaningless things goes first, and then the things that used to mean a lot just have to go. Look at verse number 19. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. The ship's tackled. You don't have a livelihood on a boat without the tackle. It's, it, that's what that's there for, is to put your product on the boat so you can deliver it. So not only is shelter and safety over their desire preeminent, but also sound security over, over a meaningless security. All of a sudden, that tackle that at one time was their livelihood is meaningless. And the soundness of the boat and the soundness of the seagoing vessel is what they're looking at. And what were their hopes in all of this? Well, you find in verse 20, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Let me ask you what time it is, brother. I think somebody got a clock to watch. 20, 24 minutes to... 24 minutes till, so I got 10 minutes. <laughs> Do you realize who's on this ship? The Apostle Paul is on this ship. Has God not told Paul he's going to go and see Caesar? Yeah. And when I read all hope is lost, I have to think that Paul was counted in that number of the hopeless yeah. at that point. Yeah. Who else is on this ship? Aristarchus is on this ship. Aristarchus was with Paul through his ministry. Aristarchus saw demons cast out of people. He witnessed the seven sons of Sceva beat up this, these false prophets. He, he knew the power of God. Luke was on this ship. The one that gave us the account of Luke and the one that gave us the account of Acts was there with Paul as they sailed. And yet we see all hope is lost. You are never a mighty enough Christian to walk through this world on your own accord. You have to rely upon the only one that gives you hope, and that's Jesus Christ. Because when the storms of this life comes, and you hear about that death that's so close to you, and you understand the difficulties of the days that you walk in, if you're not looking at God, you're going to lose hope. If Paul can lose hope, if, if, if Luke can lose hope, if the writer of the Gospels that we take into account, like Luke can lose hope. And Aristarchus? And my friends, you better not think you're sufficient in and of yourself. You better look for a word from God. Yes, sir. And that's exactly what we get here. Because when they all lost hope, their plans and their schedules, their paydays, the tackle, when all of their possessions were thrown overboard, they realized that none of that stuff was important. And all they wanted was to be saved. That's true, my friends. When a person's on their deathbed, do they think about their positions that they had in their life? Do they think about their possessions that they held on to one time so dearly? Do they take into account any of those things? No. When somebody's on their deathbed, what do they do? They think about those that they shared the life with. And they, there's, I stood beside enough deathbeds where I heard the family members talking to the one who's passing and say, Dad, do you remember when... And they talked about life. Or dad, if he could still talk, or mom, if she could still talk, if she's passing, talks to their kids, and they talk about life. And 
you remember when becomes something that's said very often. So they speak about life memories, but they also speak about life hopes. What do you have to hope for when you're laying on your deathbed? Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. You can't hope for that next promotion or that next possession or that next life achievement. All you can hope for is that what God has said is true. And they hope that heaven and forgiveness and salvation is just as God has said it is in the Word. And they hang on to verses like Hebrews 6, 19, that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. And which enters into the presence behind the veil. In other words, they look at Scripture and they say, we sure believe what God has said is true. And that's what we hold on to. You see, life is relational. It's relational with others. It's relational with God. And this storm that is set in Acts chapter 27, the storm that is set back in Matthew chapter 14, the storms that come in your life and my life, what they do is they set a stage for the introduction of God's glory. Go on and see. We'll read on. Look at this. Verses 21 through 25, and I'll close here. You know what that means in a Baptist pastor's language. <laughs> but after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Remember, the storms set the stage for God's glory. Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster <laughs> and loss. <laughs> Did I miss something? <laughs> yeah, I told you so, huh? Oh, I told you so. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I could bring that up too, but no, we're not going to. Um, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now, I urge you to take heart. Really? I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. How can you say that? Well, because the Word of God can. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 23. Remember, faith is only practice where God has spoken. Mm -hmm. It's not faith if God has not spoken. For Peter to step out of the boat on his own would have been foolishness. But because Jesus says step out of the boat, it's faith. Now we're going to hear God speak in Acts chapter 27. Paul just said, you should have done this, but there's not going to be this. This is why. He says, for there stood by me this night an angel of the God whom I belong and serve. What did God do? God took a disastrous journey in the midst of the sea in order for the God of the universe to be proclaimed to these sailors, in order for the God of the universe to be proclaimed to these soldiers that was with Paul. God took the stage of that boat and set it for His setting of glory to be seen. When you walk through a storm, that's exactly what God's doing in your life. When you keep your eyes on what He has said, and he goes on. He says, For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart again, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. God created the confines of your life and of my life to expose our need for Him in order for His glory to be shown in our greatest need. Amen. And when we get the storms of life coming through, and we get the problems of this existence hitting us and buffeting us from all sides, if we're keeping our eyes on God, yes. He will expose His glory through the midst of that storm. Yeah. Here's the greatest question that, that people bring up many times over. If God is good, and if God is just, and if God is love, and He loves man, why is there evil in the world? Again, I'll say it. God created the confines of this life to expose our need. What do we need? We need Him. Yes. In order that His glory might be demonstrated in the midst of our insufficiencies. 
This is a stage for God's glory. Everything that we encounter and everything that we see. Our greatest need of this life is what? Christ. Relationship to God and relationship to others. And storms enable us to see what's important. important. And storms enable us to act in faith. If it weren't for the storms and everything was smooth sailing, you wouldn't need God. Thank you, Lord. But because life is difficult and the journey is hard and sin is the greatest storm you'll ever walk through, mm -hmm. your need of God has been exposed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you see, coming out the other side of the storm of sin is eternal death. But since God has drawn close to you and offered His presence <clears throat> and offered His provision through Jesus Christ, <clears throat> then you get to walk through the storm of sin sinless on the other side when you've trusted what He has said. And what He has said is found in Hebrews chapter 9. Listen to this. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. Do you see the storm of sin and the storm of death? It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. There's the storm. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Do you see the way we act upon God's Word by faith? We trust Him in what He's done. My friends, if you've never trusted Christ in what He's done and what He said, then I pray that you do. Yes, sir. Because that's not a storm you want to go through the other side without His presence and without His provision. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You for the fact that You do draw near to us in the midst of the difficulties of our days. And Father, You give us Your promises and what You have said is absolutely true. And when we keep our eyes on You, we see those truths come to fruition in our lives. When You said You'll never leave us and forsake us, we can take that to the bank. When You said that You came to give us life and life more abundantly, not just in heaven, but here and now through this life, and God, we can, we can believe that. And in the midst of the most difficult days, we can look to You as the author and perfecter of our salvation for that full and abundant life that You've promised. And so, God, I pray that where you speak and that we trust you, what you've said, that we believe it, and that, Father, we follow you as you've spoken to us individually as well. And, Father, I ask this in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Always good to hear that again. Thank you, Pat. We were wired to meet you next week. Is, uh, Pastor Trevor Howard, and he's with the Bavard, uh, uh, Bavard Neighborhood Development Coalition. They're a Christian group that goes into different neighborhoods, gets grants, renovates the housing, renovates the playground, puts programs in place. He was here several weeks ago. I think that'll be a fascinating subject. And y'all please remember Sunnies. Uh, <coughs> make sure that our donations are kind of helping keep us afloat. And uh, I'll take too much burden on that. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming. Thank you.